The retrieve desire is there. Like we, you don't ever put that in a dog. It's either there or not. Knowing that's there, I start teaching my obedience at young ages, eight, nine, ten weeks old. But I'm also feeding them a little bit of the retrieve. Not much. Not till they're tired. I always talk about stop when they want more. Can obedience here, and I'm working the retrieve here, and we keep that separated till they're old enough and mature enough that we can start blending those. If you can learn communication with the dog and keep that straight, I think that helps a lot of people you know yeah they are our babies and we love on them but you can't have that first it's exercise discipline affection it's always in that order it never changes and like we flip-flop it a lot we come home from a bad day at work we'll sit down rub the dog pet on the dog we need to feel good then we go out and train he's out there in the field trying to do what you're telling him. he's like let's go back to the house yeah. and sit down and watch you know sports center i need some more petting Crisco of Whistling Wings Kennel here on the floor of Pheasant Fest in the Yukonuba booth. Jeremy, how you doing? Doing good. Doing yeah, good. fun talking to everybody, kissing babies, shaking hands, yeah. talking dogs that nonstop. Dogs are enjoying the petting and all the attention they're getting today. So probably don't think it's a good week to get everybody straightened out after all this. It, it's not too big of a shot to the ego whenever you come to shows like this where the dogs are always still in the show, <laughs> right? No, that's why we bring them because they'll draw people into the booth and distract them for you exactly and everybody can talk dogs so it's right. always good conversation starters gonna make everybody stop by it's yeah always fun bringing them along yeah and I, I would say the vast majority of people here probably enjoy the dogs more so than the people anyway absolutely so you know uh so why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself kind of tell everybody about your kennel where you're from and kind of what it is that you do you know high level stuff so uh, Jeremy Crisco from Whistling Wings Kennel. Uh, we're in Union Grove, Alabama, which is the north part of the state. Uh, we've been running now for about 13 years, uh, but I've been training professionally for 23. Mm. And kind of what we do at our kennel, um, you know, we offer six to eight specific litters each year to our clients for Labrador Retrievers. Uh, and our genetics, you know, we're importing them in from Ireland and Scotland, so it's a little bit different than what most people have. Um, but then we have our training programs, um, the normal gun dog for waterfowl upland. Upland for us is quarter and flush. Um, then our outdoor adventure dog program, which is probably our biggest program because it covers a wide range. So it's a custom-based program that if somebody wants a shed or blood dog, we can do it. Um, some of the families that don't even deer hunt or bird hunt, but they fish and they're outdoors a lot, we can adjust that dog and teach them, you know, riding in a canoe, hilling beside a bike, sitting steady when they fly fish, uh, travel, socialization to be able to travel on a plane or car or whatever. And then our general obedience, um, we kind of broke it out of the other two programs to be able to help people who were rescuing dogs or had a non-retrieving breed. Mm -hmm. But they see a lot of our gun dogs just like at the shows with all these people coming by. They don't move off the beds until we tell them to. And they kind of want that with their house companion, their house pet. So Which we, is totally doable. Yes, they just, absolutely. They just don't know the path to get there. Exactly. Yeah. So obviously a lot to unpack there. I, I want to get into the Upland Lab side of things because that's something that I don't get to talk about enough is the flushing side of the Upland world, especially in the, when it comes to labs. But the outdoor adventure, that, that's really interesting. Is this an actual, like, certification, uh, ribbon? Like, what, what is it? And, like, how long does it take? Just kind of hit the program overall. So it, it's real heavy in obedience and control of the dog. Um, but then teaching them some kind of what we call, like, formal exercise or formal job besides, you know, obedience. Uh, and it, it's custom based off, you know, the client, the owner. So, um there's not a certification program, but a lot of the dogs that we get from clients that want to go into therapy work or uh, go into nursing homes, go into hospitals, we'll put them through that program. And as they come out, then the owner goes with the dog to certify them for those different programs. So we don't offer it, but the level that the dog is coming out trained can go into those programs real well. Um, but it just started, you know, back... Um, 
maybe like 2008, 2010, we were seeing people get our gun dogs and they might hunt three to six times a year, but the dog was with the family the rest of the time of the year. Mm -hmm. And I think other people seen that and they started asking, well, what if I just get this done? And so that's when we kind of developed that program. And then we were seeing, you know, shed hunting and blood trailing for dogs has really kicked in the last couple of years. That's part of that program too. Um, we, we see quite a bit of those. Even in Alabama in the southern southeast part, you know, it's not big for shed hunting just because they, they don't last that long. But yeah. a lot of guys come out, go to Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois, come out west where they can, and that, that's they want to use their dog for it. So. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the outdoor adventure, I mean, it's, it's really just kind of getting out of, like you said, just instead of training it to hunt and then only having it to hunt, it's like, you're going to go do more stuff throughout the rest of the year. And so you kind of want a companion more so than just a, a hunting tr dog. Yeah. But, and that could take shape in a whole bunch of different ways, whether you're fishing, kayaking, hiking, or in this example, shed hunting. It's just another activity for you to get out uh, with your dog and, and enjoy time with it, right? Get out of the house, off the video games. Yeah. Enjoy the outdoors. You know, it's, we've seen a huge influx, especially of clients that are local to us in the Southeast that, are doing that family especially going through what we did 2020 21 with you know right. covid and all that people started getting outside again and so they started getting outside with their uncontrolled dogs and then <laughs> thought, okay we need to do something about this but a lot of the families you know we i see a lot of our clients come in at young ages and get a finished dog or get a dog trained they're in college well then later on in life they get married later on in life they have kids and they're wanting to pass along, you know, the hunting tradition, being outdoors. And so, you know, it's like we build pretty much those two dogs for them as they're going through life. And that's another part of what we really enjoy doing is watching. It's not training the dog. We enjoy that. But it's watching the owners connect with the dog and get outside. Get outside with the kids and the family and, like, pass all that along. That's where, you know, when I really see an owner key up with the dog, spend more time in the field or more time outside that's that's the enjoyment that i get yeah. watching that relationship build how how much of an impact do you think that by doing the companion side of things the outdoor adventure and just spending more time and, and creating a better bond what kind of impact do you really think that that has on the hunting capability because i think it makes a huge impact when i mean just you you nurture that bond when you do get the chance to go in the duck blind or go in the field with the dog, in my opinion, it's it, it makes the hunting definitely more enjoyable. But I think the dogs have a little extra step in them, in my opinion. You know, I could be looking for that, but what what would your take on that? I be? mean, it. Um, I've seen it all the way around. We've seen guys that have either tried to train their own dog or got another dog somewhere else, and it was a bad experience that burned them off of hunting with dogs. Then they see some of ours, or they go and get another dog, and they start, well, I just want obedience. I don't want to go through what I went through. Well, they're going through the obedience or outdoor adventure. You know, and another big thing that we do is owner involvement. So that owner comes in, they're going to see gun dogs work, even though they're doing outdoor adventure, and they go, okay, now I can see how my dog can act. I want yeah. to do that again. And it's a better experience. So, to, so for us, we see people getting back into hunting because they've, went through the process it's almost always describe it as like building a house it's they get to see it from the foundation up understand what and how the dog's learning but more importantly kind of how to utilize what they're learning and understanding why like why we do certain things to get what they want in their mind it's that gap between mm -hmm. knowing what they want and getting the dog there that a lot of people struggle with they may get busy reading too many books instead of focusing on one program yeah and and it just goes 20 different ways and winds up being a mess so. yeah especially when you're brand new to this trying to learn everything i i i'm a firm believer that knowledge is power right yep. but when you're when you don't know the questions to ask or what you really should be consuming that it can be drinking from a fire hose and you yeah. kind of get yourself painted into a corner that you didn't really intend to. <laughs> but you said something in there that, that I'm, I've been preaching on this podcast almost weekly on a weekly basis for years now is the why mm -hmm. to me, the why is much more important than the how, you know, we talk about like, there's so many different methods in dog training and how you want to go about this. There's so many different ways to skin this cat, 
But if you focus on the why and the, princ the, the principles of dog training across all of them, that, that's a good place to start. And then you can kind of really figure out the how if you understand why you're even trying to get the dog to do something. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, that's um, kind of us in a nutshell. Like, the why, like, in all honesty, that, that this is what we do for a living. So I make, I make food on the table for my family by training dogs. But, again, I get a lot of enjoyment off of helping somebody actually train their dog for their self because I'm seeing them learn and, like, they really understand the why. Uh, and, you know, there's different breeds for different things, you know, and trying to make people – or teach them or show them how to find the right breed for what it is they're about to do. Mm -hmm. You know, not necessarily getting a bloodhound to go to retrieve ducks or <laughs> a Malinois to go retrieve ducks. You know, it's it's picking your breed, picking your lifestyle and matching all that up, then finding your program and then understanding why you're about to do what you're going to do with a dog. It's that, I mean, that that's enjoyment for us. And I think today – it's a lot easier than it was like when I started. You know, back when I started, it was just books or just maybe a DVD yeah. or VHS tape. So, like, now social media, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, podcasts, like, there's a lot of information out there that can educate people on the why and how to train it. Yeah. But how would you advise somebody brand new first getting into this? Because you bring up, I mean, we talk about it all the time, like, you, you're Google search away from an endless amount of information now, right? Like the phone in our pocket, to your point, you had to go search out and read and do your due diligence and really dig out this information. So it was, it was hard earned. Now you can do a Google search and then you're getting 30 different ways yeah. to doing the exact same thing. How do, how do you advise people to know the difference between advice you should take or consider an advice that maybe you should steer away from i mean i think it's um it's vetting but it's also research especially the research that we know we have to do now to make sure something's true yeah but like you know it's um i tell people it, it, we get phone calls somebody calls wants a pup i'll tell them about my litters and i'll tell them about my dogs but I make sure that I educate them because they may not buy a pup from me, but I want the next person they go talk to to be just like a, somebody that's following through a health clearances and genetical testing and understanding the pedigrees, but then also looking at each individual dog. Every dog has, there's no such thing as a perfect dog, so they all have something wrong, and it's balancing it out to get a pup. And I, I want them going to another kennel that, that looks at it the same way, so I educate them on how to find that right kennel, you know, call and talk to them, look at their website, look at their social media, look at their previous customers and go visit them, mm -hmm. you know, go see the facilities, meet the person, meet the dog and do that with multiple ones. And then you're going to get a feeling about which one you feel is the right one, you know, and it, there's a, there's a connection you need to make with your breeder and your trainer. That's going to help you be successful at the end of the road not going off a whim, not buying at some kind of event, you know, like really study. Cause that dog is going to be with you for 15 plus years or 12 plus years. Like you want to make sure you're not getting something that's not right for you or, you know, health problems or any of that. So, yeah. uh, you know, doing things like you can Uber, you know, they, that's, they're vetting out those guys that like us that are on that program. And like, that's another way to vet who you're talking to is looking at that, but it's, Good nutrition, good new genetics. You can tell when breeders are really putting their passion into it, you know, yeah. and that's by going and visiting and talking to them and research, you're going to see that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, I, you know, I get a lot of listeners that reach out, especially new people. They, they maybe just find the podcast. They're interested. They're trying to figure out how do I find the right breed? And it's like, well, you kind of have to, what's your end goal, right? Like, let's figure out what kind of dog do you want upland? Do you want waterfowl do you yeah. want a mixture of both to your point mat matching that breed up but then it, what what i think is really hard for a lot of people brand new to it is understanding that there's as much differences within the breed as there are amongst the breeds yeah and that's where you're talking about fine you know it's not enough to just say okay i want a lab I, we settle on a lab well now what kind of lab do we want you know, yeah. it, it, and you, I mean, you can go as high level on this of just like, do you want an English lab or not? 
or do you want certain qualifications? Do you want a lab yeah. that's more upland? Do you want a lab that's proven in the AKC trial game? Whatever. Uh, and that's where ask everybody, you know, come up with the list of, I don't know, your checklist that yeah. you're wanting to vet all these guys off. So you're comparing apples to apples. It, the, a lot of people, they brand new, they'll, they'll just call up breeders and they'll just be like, you know, tell me why you like your dogs. Well, everybody likes yeah. their dogs, right? Yeah. Like everybody has the best system and the best dog because they're making dogs to fit what they want. Yeah. It's, you know, it, the question is, it, will it match up with what you want? Yeah. And so if you have your checklist and you're asking all of the breeders and kennels the same questions, to your point, then you're going to find that. You start narrowing it down. You start narrowing and filtering it down, and then your gut instinct will, yeah. it will kick in when you find the right fit. And, I mean, that's uh, even people that I talk to all the time call us about pups. It's um, like I tell them, yeah, these, you know, for instance, we got – uh, Toad, her litter fits in a drop in two weeks, and it's a repeat with Duke and Toad. So we know what they've produced in the past. But in the beginning, people would call, and I would tell them about the upcoming litter, and we might have a spot or two available, and I'd tell them, this is what we love about Toad, this is what we love about Duke. But this is what's wrong, or the issues we've seen with Duke coming up through training and competing, in some way with Toad, and that's why we're putting these two together, is they offset this. And I tell them, you know, if you're going to another place and you, they're saying these are the best dogs producing the best pups and there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. Run for the hills. Run for the hills. Because, like, as a breeder, we have to struggle with looking at the bad. you got to add yeah. that in because it's coming. And, like, you know, it's just being humble enough to identify and say we're trying this for this reason to fix that. Right. Then you get into your second and your third repeat. That means, hey, we did hit something right. And it's been consistent with the litters. That's um, knowing your pedigrees in the background and what grandfather's producing, what the great-grandfather did produce, and adding that thought process into the, the equation can help you get really close to what you think you're going to get, but it can still be kind of a gamble. So it's telling people that that can happen, you yeah. know. Um, but another one is is finding the right kennel with what they're doing. So, like, somebody comes to me and they want a hunting dog, but they want a competitive dog. Sometimes we're not a competitive, big competitive kennel like Mossy Pond and Brad and Lee and them. Those guys are crushing it with the SRS, field trial and hunt test. And if that's the game you're wanting to get in, that's the dog you need to go with. Now, if you want a hunting dog, a family dog, and maybe run, you know, mid-level kind of competitive stuff or get the family involved with it, okay, you can get one of our dogs and you're going you're gonna to do it all very well. Mm -hmm. um, just like, you know, there's guys that may upland hunt big time with quail and out west out here, you know, and like you may want to look more at a Munchlander or a Drotar or a GSP or a Pointer, you know, it, and we'll direct them to people that we know in the business that we've been dealing with that I feel comfortable saying go to this guy and talk to him. And that, that's that balance you're talking about of knowing what you're getting and talking to the kennels, making sure that they know the good things and the bad things and, you know, that feeling. Yeah. You're constantly asking questions to get that good feeling inside, this is it. Yep. And that's a that's a huge thing. And it's a tough pill to swallow for a lot of people just getting used to recognizing the the faults or the shortcomings of their own individual dog. Because let's face it, we all love our dog and we mm -hmm. all think highly of our dogs. But that's that's actually been one of the most uh, common criticisms I get from my listeners is they think that I'm too tough on my dogs, yeah. right? <laughs> just acknowledging that, hey, you know, that this one dog has this shortcoming and it's like, how are you going to fix something if you don't even accept that there's something that needs fixing? Yeah. And by extension, somebody that's breeding that dog and they're putting, they're progressing that lineage through those dogs, they need to know what they're trying to fix. Like, you know, it, it's to me, there's so much proof or so many examples of like quote unquote legends, yeah. uh, it, you know, in any of the testing environments, flush, flushing, pointing, uh, that those dogs just don't throw well. Right. Yeah. And so if you only go off of pedigree, then, you know, it could work out. It could also not work out. If you're talking to a breeder and they're telling you that there's nothing wrong with my line, it's perfect. It's it's, you yeah. know, don't look anywhere else. Then to your point, that's that's a breeder that's maybe not trying to 
improve that line. Correct. It's just they're just trying to sell dogs. Yeah, yeah. And you bring up the the upland side of the world. When somebody comes to you, and like you said, if, if you want, you know, maybe a little bit of upland, maybe something that you can compete with, the companion do dog, that's more of your style, right? What, in your opinion, qualifies a good, if somebody's listening to this, that maybe they want a, a lab that does upland effectively, what, what are the different qualities that they should look at within that pedigree or even characteristics within the parents that maybe just don't lend itself to maybe the high level AKC retriever trials right yeah and that's so for us uh and i've got one that's with us this weekend he's going to be in here tomorrow as a young dog one-year-old dog named cannon his owner is a big quail hunter but the training that we've done in the excuse me the beginning was for quail and kind of upland style hunting now he's coming back he's back with me for a couple months now to kind of what i call straighten him out get him under control because we are going to run some stuff with him and for that dog, for Cannon, he can make the transition. But what you know, we tell people, uh, usually do it by region. So, like, if we got guys out in the southeast that talk about upland hunting but also duck hunt, it's on a percentage basis. Most of the time, they're probably about 40% upland, 60% duck. Yeah. So, where to – for that to be successful in that relationship – we still train the dog like a waterfowl dog. We line them out, lengthen them out real big, uh, big marks, big handling, big blinds. We teach them how to use that nose, but we tell the guys that for the first year, don't feed that too much because that's like that natural behavior. And it, a smart, well-bred dog, it doesn't take them too long to figure out. I don't need him telling me what to do. There's birds in this field, and I'm having fun, and then they're gone. Yeah. Um, just like hunting them too much then you're trying to line the dog out. He's going to run at about his threshold of 50, 60, 70 yards, and he's going to break down to his nose, not using his eyes, and it could be another 200 yard out in the field. But for my guys that are out west that we train dogs, we know it's opposite. 60%, you know, they got way more advantage of more property of quail hunting, pheasant hunting, and duck hunting, but the duck hunting is on small, usually pothole stuff. So we'll train the dog more for an upland. So like our upland labs, We'll teach them multiples on lining, but it's never past 70 yards. Okay. And then more heavy on control of the flush, control of using that nose, shutting it off, recalling, casting, and keep them in. You know, and you go hunt a pothole, the dog's going to pick the bird. But what he needs more is the keen nose of when to flush and sit or when to work the wind and figure out where these birds are moving to to get his guy in there to make the shot. And so – that dog isn't going to line out on a big 200-yard blind straight. You know, we just make sure they understand that he can pick it. This is going to take a lot more cast to get there. It's not going to be a, a straight line. It's not line. just going to be as clean. Correct, correct. Yeah. But for going back to Canyon, like, now that he's done a little bit of that quail hunting this year, his first season, he got to hunt up a little bit. He didn't push an entire field, but when his owner would get down to the end of the field and he's kind of corralled in with tree lines or fence lines, he couldn't blow out. He was keeping him tight. So he was staying under control. Now we're going back and revisiting, lining, and marking, and handling, and going to lengthen that back out, and he's making that transition good. Uh, some dogs don't. You know, some dogs out of the same litter may not be able to do that. Yeah. But for him, he can, and so we're teaching him how to control each of those kind of natural behaviors he wants to do and when to use them, when not to use them. And one thing that I've noticed, especially in the pointing dog world, and I'm curious if it tra if it transfers over into your world, is you have a lot of people that they'll, we're essentially talking balance, right? Is is you don't independence versus dependence. You don't want to really encourage one one more so than the other unless it fits the end goal. In the pointing dog world, we also have a lot of people that like they'll get their pointing dog that requires a lot of independence to go hunt upland in that style. And they immediately just hammer the obedience. They hammer the obedience, and it kind of, it kind of pulls them in. It reins them in. Yeah. And so I'm curious if that transfers over into your world, to where you know, hey, this dog is going to be a predominantly that 60% upland dog out west that you're describing. So labs being what they are, we all kind of know that like they're kind of known for quote unquote pleasing the owner yeah. and that dependence and that obedience. 
when you do have that 60% upland dog, that's the end goal. Are you still hitting the obedience at an early age as oh, yeah. often and as hard, and it doesn't take any of their independence or hunt or desire to hunt out later? Absolutely. I mean, that's I always tell our puppy buyers, at eight weeks when your pup's coming home, if there's one thing I can tell you to make sure they do, socialize. Everywhere you can go and carry the dog, carry him. But start teaching them from day one. Like they're little, I call them little sponges. Like they're looking yeah. to learn. And it's not big. I mean, it's taking a little pup, just like these beds the dogs are sitting on. Take a treat, show him the treat, pull your hand over the bed. As he climbs up to get it, load, you know, raise it up where he's got to look up at it. He sits down, sit, sit. give him the treat. You're engaging the dog. You're engaging the dog, and that, that's part of that socialization. You know, a lot of people want to, oh, I got a crate train and put it in a crate, and then they're gone for four hours. They come back, go to the bathroom. Now they're busy again. So carrying the dog with you everywhere is going to make you do something. Tell him right. no, come here, see it, hold him, uh, engage, engage the dog. And, like, we're doing it from the beginning. If, as a breeder, I've done my research, knowing the background, knowing the genetics, the retrieve desire is there. Like, we, you don't ever put that in a dog. It's either there or not. So, like, knowing that's there, I start teaching my obedience at young ages, eight, nine, ten weeks old, but I'm also feeding them a little bit of the retrieve. Not much. Not till they're tired. We always talk about stop when they want more. Right. And so what happens, it's like the two-part series. I'm working obedience here, and I'm working the retrieve here. And we keep that separated till they're old enough and mature enough that we can start blending those. And it, it turns into the dog starts understanding, if I go get it, come back, I get another. If I sit here and wait and listen for my name, I get another. And so that's kind of how we're intertwining that obedience. So by the time we get to formal training and complicated things, they can handle the force or the formal part of training of saying, no, you can't get that yet. No, you got to sit to a whistle, you cast, and then boom, you find it. Like, they can handle that processing. That's when things speed up in training. You know, a dog a dog at six months is what we call ready for formal training, most of them. There's some of them that can be a little still puppyish, you know, and yeah. they may not be ready yet, you know. But if you're doing your things from eight weeks to six months, at six months, you better get going because they're going to outgrow you fast. Yeah. And they're going to figure out he has no clue or she has no clue what they're doing. It's my world now, and that's a whole different kind of six months independent getting, ball. Yeah, game. they're getting into that little independence drive, <laughs> yeah. and, and it, you know that's what, especially in the in the upland side and pointers, like we talk about balance so much because it's like you don't want to rain so much obedience on them that it takes that independence from them. But at the same time, if you don't do any obedience by the time you do need to go out in that field it's kind of hard to work with, right? Yeah. Like you, they don't have the tools. You don't have the recall and stuff like that. Uh, as far as the range, you know, you talk about these dogs, these are Labrador retrievers. It's in the name. They're, they have the retrieve drive. What about the range, though? When you're talking flushing dogs, you need them working within gun range of you. Is that genetic or are you guys working check cords? How are, how are you establishing that range with the walking hunter? I've always said... If you can't control your dog within 20 yards of you, why are you even trying at 200? So, like, we just, for eight weeks to six months, I'm going on walks with the dog. Puppies don't know to go big yet. You'll start seeing them range out. And every time they hit my threshold, I'm calling them and walking them opposite. So I don't use a lot of um, check cords. I understand, and I have, I'm not a big pointer guy, so I don't want to... Yeah say that this is the end all be all but like you know pointers use a lot of the the check cords because they're trying to turn the dogs and they're genetically as a puppy they won't run yeah they're gone so labs <laughs> want to run but it it's never like you can see them they'll run 10 yards from you and get in the grass and they turn around and they're like oh where's that yeah. you know so we're just using that against them if they run to the right and they hit my threshold i'm walking to the left as i start calling them and here they come running and they pass me good boy he's going that way hits the threshold that way I'm, walk, I'm just walking and constantly calling the dog to me and it's not every time i call them to them putting them on a lead you know they yeah. may come to me and i throw them a retrieve they may come to me and get a pet or they may get come to me and be able to run right past you got to teach them that good is good as a recall yeah. yeah and it's 
they naturally are biddable dogs, want to do what we want, want to make sure we're happy. And so we're just kind of using that against them. And that's kind of, and we keep them there like Cannon. Cannon is one of the fastest dogs I've seen in a long time. He could naturally do some really long stuff when he was like six, seven, and eight months old, natural. And like, I seen it, but I still honed all that in. Cause if I can't control him good at 40, I wasn't gonna let him keep learning. And the further I am from Jeremy, he can't get me. Yeah. You know, so just understanding that, that you, you'll get time down the road to go big, keep everything short, get it solidified in the dog, make it perfect and then push it out, you know, and keeping at that 50 yard range, teaching everything, you'll see, you'll, you'll see what's going to pay the dividends at the end with your control when he's two and 300 yards out. You know, it's, um, it's just kind of how we do things. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it distance erodes control. I mean, that, yes. that's it, it, absolutely what we're talking about. And I'm curious with, you know, you establish that there's a difference between the labs that you guys do and maybe those really high level, like high drive trial dogs, uh, fill in the blank with which with ever organization. Is there a difference with how you would train that style dog? Because you Absolutely. said that like yours, it stays closer to you. Maybe it doesn't have as much independence drive, but I would think that you would need a little bit of that in the dog that wants to go 800 yards for a retreat, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, do it, that level of dog, the big runners, as we call it, or the big field trial, the dogs that, you know, Brad and Lee and them run, like those dogs naturally are bred to use eye first, no second. Um, a guy I know um, that trained field trial dogs for years, Labs, actually bought a dog for me a couple of years ago just because he wanted to know the difference. And he trained that dog the same way, one of ours, just like he does an American dog. And what we, what he was kind of reporting back to us at earlier ages, the dog, he could see when they threw a mark, it'd pick a 150 yard mark cause he's training it like the American genetics and the dog would leave and run. But he, you could tell that every time the dog left for a mark, his head would drop, he was dropping his nose or she was dropping her nose. She was running with her eyes, but that nose was still there yeah. versus a, another level dog. Head was up a little more. They were pinning it with their eyes a little more. Um, pressure going through uh, a thing on the American kind of training side of force fetch going through that with her she didn't take as much force as the American dog it not that she as was she didn't require more or she just didn't she, take it she didn't require it okay so like where and not saying she did it better than the other one it's just where the more kind of bred to be a little more higher strong Yep. needed just a little bit more convincing of the pressure of doing certain things. She just needed it one time. So oh, I don't want that and just, you know, kind of moved on. But other than that, a lot of the similarities were still somewhat the same, but then it brought on a conversation that we had with him, which I thought was really good is a lot of stuff that you see today in the games from the big levels, you know, nationals and SRS and, even the hunt test game now, I've seen, I've seen a change for me running when I started till now. A lot of the setups we get, are it's for dogs to more of what, what can you train your dog to do versus what is natural for that dog to want to do. Okay. So, like, you know, you know, a dog running 300 yards on land down to the pond and then trimming that corner of the pond to go pick that mark so he can win because he's being judged against everybody else. That's not a natural thing. There are dogs that are what we call watery that will do that, but those are few and far between. A lot of it is taught how to make that decision when you get that far out as to where a smart dog runs down. And he goes, well, that's just two foot. I'm whip around that picket and get back a lot faster, right. you know? So that's more of the natural instinct. But back in the day, they didn't see a lot of that. But I think it's because as the dogs got better about breeding and smarter and better characteristics, they had to start putting those setups in there to split the field, figure out who was the best dog. But a lot of the dogs that we, all the dogs that we use for our breeding program have come from Ireland and Scotland and they run trials and I've ran trials over there with dogs. And it's just more of, uh, we're being tested and judged on what is on a normal day's hunt. And so more of what we see is still the length and the distance, but you know, it may be a creek and we got to cross the creek that's a hundred yards from us 
go on the other side of the creek and then run another 200 yards up a six degree incline on a mountain to pick a bird that fell up there. You know, and it's, we're not judged on, did he run down 10 yards and cross? Did he cross through this certain point? It was, how did he get there the fastest and back the fastest? Uh, and, you know, was he quiet? You know, did he make the retrieve? Did you have to handle him? Uh, did he run on something wrong? You know, so it's just a different game. So like our dogs or the British style dog, um, they've been bred all those years for that, just like the American guys have been bred all these years to do their competitive stuff. So it's, I guess it's just seeing those differences, knowing if either one of those fits better in your hunting or what you're about to do with a dog to kind of help you make the decision. But then also too, okay, do I want an American field trial line dog to go up and hunt? Probably not. Right. Um, you know, you may want a British lab, you may want a golden retriever, you may want a Boykin Spaniel, you may want a Cocker, you know, it's, it's all about finding what, what truly is the type of hunting you're going to do and plugging the dog in there. Yeah. And I, I would like to get your take uh, to, to kind of extend on the, the trial conversation and distinguishing the difference because a lot of this, I'm torn. Like, I love watching it. I love watching guys play pool with dogs at, you know, 500 yards out. It's cool. Like, and yeah. just the dog trainer in me appreciates the level and, yeah. and the commitment the that it takes to get that. But the hunter in me, I'm like, that, that, that would never happen, right? And, and, and so, like, I'm kind of torn between that. And then one thing that, coming from the versatile side of the world, we do an independent duck search. It's not the most attractive retrieve in the world. It, it kind of throws a lot of guys off, especially from the retriever world. But it is it is effective when trained right. But I think that there's a, a healthy balance to where you can whistle and guide a dog if you need to. The thing that always trips me up coming from a duck hunting perspective when you have a dog that is literally relying on the sight and and steering so to speak is what happens when you get into the area that is full of cattails and the dog can't see you you can't see them and the dog doesn't have the hunt em up commander it's not genetically good to use its nose like are we is that system in your opinion really producing like high level quality duck hunting dogs or is it just a game and i'm fine either way with it but like i just I, I kind of struggle with kind of connecting the two. I think that, honestly, somewhat can be 50-50. Too much control can be bad and good. Too much natural hunt and dig it out can be bad or good. But if you're teaching a good foundation of obedience, then it should be good on both sides, in my opinion. So, like, um, for instance, if I shoot a bird and it goes into cattails, the dog gets in there. I can't see him. He can't see me, but I know he's close. We train in with our hunting dogs a hunt whistle. So me telling the dog, like our command is loss, L-O-S-S. -S. When I say loss, that means the dog to hunt a 10-yard circle. Don't get outside of that. Hold it tight, dig it out. The whistle that we teach along with that command is going to carry a lot further than my voice sometimes. So if he's staying in there, he's not finding a bird, then I'm going to bring him out and put him downwind of where I think it hit and almost let him go and watch the dog. Sometimes we don't trust our dogs enough. You know, yeah. I talked to our clients about this. They get out there, they know the dog's handling, they want to stop and put the dog in the air, get the bird, get back fast, but the dog keeps pulling to another area. And I have to say, hey, 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 trust the dog for a minute. And then lo and behold, the dog swoops around, downwind, runs in, picks the bumper. They were off, the dog wasn't. So sometimes I think you have to trust the dog, but if your genetics are right, the dog will do the work. You just gotta trust them. You yeah. gotta have a little bit of the control, but then let the dog go in a way, I think. Is that kind of... Yeah, I mean, it, it's again, it goes back to that word balance, you know, the yeah. same way that we use it on drive and, and kind of balancing that out with, with obedience at an early age. It's, it's the same thing with this is I, I'll kind of, again, it, in the perfect world, you have that dog that you can just send them on in your, in your words, loss. I use search, whatever, uh, but then also being able to whistle and give them a little bit of hand signals and a little bit of help to where it's like, at the end of the day, you know, the, the NAVDA junkies here, they, they love the duck search, right? Yeah. Send your dog. It could be 25 minutes and your dog finally comes back with a bird. I've done that. It's pretty cool to where it's just like, man, it went in those cattails somewhere yeah. over there. 
go find it, and then you just kind of go sit back in the blind. But then also there's a time to where, especially if birds are flying around and you don't want to spook them, but you don't want to lose that bird, maybe you cripple it and you don't want to give it time to get further away, to be able to direct your dog and help them out, give them a little helping hand of yeah. like, hey, get that duck and get back in here. And uh, so it is – you got to have a little bit of both, in my opinion. I kind of learned that early on. I trained a draw tar named Falco. Went through a gun dog program, six months of training, control training. Okay. Then he wants to go run the VJP, which is the beginning one. And, like, his control hurt him a little yeah. bit on the duck find, the quail find. Field search, yeah. And it was they wanted to see more of a natural ability. I had put so much control on the dog that he would find it, but he would check back. Am I right? Yep. Yeah. You know, like they needed to see a little bit more natural ability from him. And running that taught me a lot is like put the control in there a little bit, but let the dog like don't get in a hurry to teach all the time. Like let them develop. Yeah. I would say that's probably the number one thing a lot, I know a lot of guys teach to other clients is like, you know, there's always that one dog out of 400 that got its HRCH when he was eight and 10 <laughs> months old, right? right. Yeah. And we all want that dog, but not every dog is that, you know, and that's learning to be patient or make haste slowly, as we call it. Let them develop, you yeah. know, teach them things, but don't put so much in there that they lose all their natural want to. They're always looking back, you know, it's having a dog, it's just you know, 2% independent and then 4% behavior and then a little bit of control. It's let them have a little fun. They, in my opinion, a dog that goes through training and never makes a mistake and never gets corrected or never does anything wrong that you got to reteach. That To me, that's a dog I can't trust. Right. But a dog that through training has messed up on a few things and let me show them stuff, but then they've also been able to develop that's a dog to me. That's yeah. one that I can trust. I can let them go, and they're going to be able to handle situations like that when they get into the area and the bird's not there, and you're trying to push them in the other area. He's going to know. He's got to show me, no, Dad, we need to check this spot real quick. Okay, go do it. Boom, he finds the bird. Yeah. You know. I call it grit. You know, I, yep. nothing, nothing annoys me more than when I'm in the field with a dog. Like, not all dogs are created equal. Not all dogs in every situation are, are going to act the same way. But when a dog gives up, yeah that that all oh, that that yeah fires it's, just, it, it's just nails on a chalkboard for me and, yeah and i got one dog that she doesn't give up because she lacks desire to your point she gives up because she's looking to me like for affirmation like, yeah. Oh, it, yeah am i still doing it right like am i still and it's like well you just go do it like you know you're doing it yeah and that's frustrating and, and that kind of goes into what we were talking about earlier is is balancing that obedience and understanding that like if you have a a pointing dog you maybe should not be doing that level of of control that a lab guy that you see on instagram is doing and and it is two completely different things and the good yeah. trainers know the difference right like you said you learned that lesson with, with that draught and uh that's something that i think we're seeing more and more of in the pointing dog world to where it, you have to establish that love to hunt first in the pointing side yeah. because that is their job is to go find and search and point the game for you all the other stuff the obedience and retrieve comes after them finding birds you have to create that that love to hunt and yeah. you know them being angry at birds in all the right ways yeah and that's what's so fascinating to me with flushing dogs is it seems like right out of the gate you can establish that level of control and it doesn't hurt you even if you are on the upland side of things because like you said you have to keep them within range and even on your hunt them up command you don't want them going past 10 yards when we give a search command or hunt them up command we want them yeah search within 10 yards but if you don't find it in 10 yards Move. expand expand yeah. expand don't just keep running in the same same circles and so so much of it is so similar but also very different at the same time as it should be we see the same thing in labs like especially about two months in we're doing lining drills with them and even then we have like a five lane field we're teaching just lining but even a young pup you've been doing that trailing memory at 40 yards well then all of a sudden that next day you're throwing it and it goes an extra 20 and the dog hits that threshold, I'm looking for the dog that sees that it's not there and pushes forward out in the field. 
not the one that says, oh, it's not right here where it's supposed to be, and starts hunting back towards me. That's kind of one of my pet peeves, I guess, or kind of the nails on the chalkboard. But I want to see them naturally. They hit the area and look and say, oh, it's not here because it's cut grass, and then keep moving forward deeper into the field and, boom, find it. Because to yeah. me, that at an early age is showing me a problem solver. And it's, it's a problem solver not to make me happy to finish the job, go grab it, come back. Yeah. And knowing how to handle it. And some of that is not taught. It's it, it, it's natural in them. Yeah. It, it's it's essentially just, it goes back to that grit. Do you have the yeah. work ethic, yeah. right? And yeah. it's just like understanding back to what you're talking about, getting a dog very early on on the place and understanding how to get paid. If I, if I get on the place board, I get paid. If I sit, I get paid. If, if it's not here, maybe I just wait here longer. He calls my name, I get paid, right? It's like you send them on that that 40 yard memory yeah. drill that happened to land 60 yards and they're like hold up he sent me i don't get paid unless i go get that bumper yeah as opposed to maybe a dog that thinks that i get paid just by Coming going back by. to dad right yeah yep. so it, it, it's all fine lines and stuff like that when you start working your lines you're talking about the the uh the cut lanes in the grass how how big of a difference do we need in the cut? Like, are we talking a few inches or are we talking feet? Because, you know, it's like my fields are broom sage. You know, they're three, four feet tall. I'll go yeah. cut a lane and, and I'm, I'm doing some lines with my dogs. And I sometimes I ask myself, I'm like, is this really helping? Because it's like they the can't hallway. even see over the grass. Yeah. And it, 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 I just ask, like, I mean, am I just conditioning the dog or is it really getting them used to go in a straight line for me? Yeah, I mean, it is, uh, it is in my opinion, still teaching lining because when you come out in the open, he don't know to run any other way than straight. Everything's been found straight, whether it was a big a hallway of real thick grass. But, you know, we, at a young age, we have our lane field. I would say just enough for it to be a visual to the dog. Sometimes that can be ankle high to boot high. You know, if I was going to keep it that way, I would have it at boot high. Okay. Because a young dog is going with just a single or even a double that's really spread out. You're keeping it simple. Like you don't have one in this lane and one 10 yards over. By the time you get to running 10 yards over, your dog understands how to line and go to the one scent, not switch. Yeah. So, you know, I would say boot high to ankle high. But our we got a sage field the same way. Um, by the end of the winter, it's about, you know, yeah. waist high. Come in, cut hay, starts growing again. But even after a good hay cutting, you can still see where we've been mowing those lanes. Right. And even enough for a pup to use that, which is, you know, close to ankle high. So, like, it's still valuable to the dog and what you're teaching. But then we also use other straight edges, a tree line, a fence line. Um, it can be a flat 40-acre field that's mowed, cut, short, but I've got a road bed where a truck's been going that's down through there. That is a visual for the dog to stay straight, you know. And we're changing it. It could be the bank of a pond, you know, the levee of a pond. Um, it could be a driveway. Just anything that's a visual for the dog. And, and we're not tricking, you know. It's um, I think people, when they're training, sometimes test their dogs too much on a daily basis. You know, it should be simplified to a point it's getting boring for you as a trainer that's when it's time to kind of step up and add something else in there so like uh you know young dogs going through the program they won't really start seeing doubles completed together and tight till they're 10 11 months old and i know they can think it through you know it's 90 degrees to 180 degrees or a lot of singles like we may like thinking of a clock i may run one that's at nine o'clock as a single 12 o'clock as a single three o'clock as a single and that's kind of a triple especially if i'm repeating that every day to where then it's nine o'clock and three o'clock or it's 12 and three or it's nine and 12 and once i see those can be run as doubles now we're ready to start getting it a little closer you know and by that time the dog can make the decision and not if he switches it's a blatant switch we know somewhere he confused things we gotta make a correction or simplify it again um we have a term called the KISS method, keep it, keep simple, it simple, stupid. Yep. So, you know, it's breaking it back down. There's some of my old dogs, when they come in, and old to me is a finish level dog, it's two and a half and older, come in from a hunting season that are switching like crazy because they've been switching all season. Guess what that dog's running for a little while? The same thing he run when he was eight months old. Just to remind him, 
without having to put pressure, hey, bud, this is how we do this. This is how it's run. Now let's try it again because if it's not good when we go back to multiples, you are going to get corrected because it means you're you're making the decision to do it how you want to. Yeah. So it's it's thinking the process of what you're doing with your dog. Yep. But, you know, it don't have to be a huge visual, just enough that the dog knows it's a straight it. line. Just enough to where if they do veer off, you do need to get a correction that, like, the dog is understanding, oh, it's because I left the line. Yes. Something yes, like that. Yes. You know, it, you, you use KISS. I, I tell everybody, like, I, I like using a, a teach, train, test because I'm with you. I think a lot of people test their dogs too soon, and it's like, teach the behavior make it i mean super black and white i yeah. mean it'll just hold their hand and then training it as to where you're really just kind of providing that context and rounding it out and then testing it's like all right different different environments let's see where yeah where the dog is and to your point some people was like they're gonna go put put a behavior on a dog in like oh, one ready session to move. Yeah. and it's just like oh let's let's see if the dog can do this it's like you are probably just going to negate everything you just did teaching the dog yeah. right but it, it is it's tough to wear it's like oh you saw the initial like that light bulb flicker it's hard not to be like let's see if it just see happens, how it goes right yeah. let's just see how it goes we talk about that in our obedience class our outdoor adventure and our gun dog to our clients is like two things i tell people don't go in a situation thinking, let's see how this goes, because it ain't going to go well. Right. Go into a situation saying, I know how my dog's going to act, or I know if my dog does this, I can control him this way. That means you know what to do when it goes bad. You know what to do when it goes right. The other thing that you'll know when to make your steps is what I call the five and five. It's five times in five locations. Yeah. It's a performed habit. You're ready to move and, and challenge the dog and test, you yeah. know. If you're kind of sticking to those two things, you'll be surprised like how that kind of goes away down the road because you're learning how fast your dog's picking things up and ready to make the move. Yeah. You're not guessing at it. And a lot of that stuff is is kind of comes out of the the wild rose method. If somebody wanted a name out of it, like so much of the stuff that you, the memories, the loss, all all that, like if you if you wanted a book, we could Absolutely. go back to a method, go check that out. Yep. Uh, now, do you use e collars in your program? Um. Not on a normal basis, no. Um, but if I've got a dog that I'm bringing up as goes a, a buy a puppy and bring it from Ireland, and I know that the intention is that dog to go in our breeding program, we're going to train it. We're going to background check it. We're going to do our health clearances. But we're also going to test the dog and, and run hunt tests and. I'll take it still dog by dog, meaning like I know we're going to run tests, meaning we're going to have cheating marks, we're going to have down to short blinds. So there are methods that we have of drills and training and the method of training that we teach them that I try to get them at a point of running down the shore to like do it naturally. But then there are times some of them don't handle that well. And so we have to have a way of correcting using a dog and we'll use an e-collar. Yeah. Um, our program is not built off of it. Our program is not built off of a force top method, but you know, the callers just teach them how to shut the pressure off. And so, you know, we introduce it with sit recall. Then we go to water, you know, and they're going to learn, you know, like finding a little corner. We pitch the bumper out in the middle of the water. He gets, it gets praised there and back. We get a little bit closer to the bank, praised there and back. When he grabs it and gets out of the water to come to me, it's a low level Nick till he gets to me. I grab the bumper, we go back to the middle, throw one out in the middle, he gets in, gets it, comes back straight. He's got a lot of praise. And, like, that's some of the methods that we'll, at times we will use a collar. Yeah. Uh, sometimes some of the client dogs that come in have been running with bumpers and kids have been chasing it. <laughs> and we use check cords then to try to build a recall or retrieve, but sometimes you've got to go to the e-collar. And, like, you know, we always discuss it with our clients, explain it. They're going to see it as they're coming in to visit the dog. Um, and then we work it to a point, but by the time the dog comes home, he don't need the e-collar, but that client has it to go back to and, you know, reinforce some if things needed. if the dog needed it. Yeah. yeah. So let, let's go back to that example where the dog comes out of the water and you're just doing that slow nick, that probably just, just slow trickle, almost that drop from a faucet, uh, on that nick what is the purpose of that to get them to speed back up to you to have something different other than my voice saying no 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 you know it, it as we call it makes land hot water cool right um and and it's a lot of misinterpretation with people in the collar is burn 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 
it's a lot of the terminology I feel like that's used in it. For us, it's a, a stimulation. It's a correction enough that he knows something's different. Yeah. It should not be enough that he's dropping the bumper and now I'm telling him to fetch it back up or I'm, by, I'm back into that battle. It's just enough that as he's coming around, he's feeling that correction around his neck, which is just like a lead pop on the heel. Yep. That, okay, this ain't right. And then he threw it in the water and it's good. And then the next time we go back to the cheaty retrieve, a lot of times if I've had a lot of corrections, as soon as they come out of the water, grab the bumper, pee, blow a sit whistle, have them sit. And then I'll recall with a whistle, pee, 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 and I'll walk opposite of where I'm, he's trying to go. So like if he's trying to cheat around the right, I'll walk to the left. They're sitting down, I'm hitting a recall walking that way. They hit the water. And if they hit the water, that's the jackpot. Good boy, you know, big praise verbal and visual for them and usually after that it's kind of done um then we're just going to move it to where that cheat is further out you know again working that 20 40 yards in get it understood now we start moving where it's further out which at that point it's not just teaching them not to run the bank it's how to make that decision when you're you know make the same decision when you're further away uh and that, that's how we do things i know guys have other drills um, but, yeah, that's where we would use a collar a lot. Oh, there's a million drills that everybody does a million different oh, ways, yeah, right? Yeah. It, and they all that, work. That's why I don't run out of anything to talk about and yeah. ask about, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's really interesting. A, a couple things as, as we kind of start uh, coming to the landing here is throughout this entire conversation, numerous times and numerous ex examples you've talked about going the opposite way, using the opposite with the dogs. I think a lot of people don't, I don't know, uh, recognize the value in that, mm -hmm. especially, you know, back to the first timers and young puppies, especially, you know, dog as a bird, doesn't want to give it to you. Yeah. It's running around. What do people do? They're yelling, recalling, running, at running the dog. chasing the dog, yeah. like, you know, here, here, here. And I'm like, it's amazing how some dogs, young dogs, you don't even have to walk away from them. You just turn around yeah. and then guess who's at your feet. And, uh, you know, it's amazing how young dogs that have recall problems. You know, you pretty much described how you keep that dog within range and you're recalling that dog with just your body language communicating yeah. to them. You know, it, it, how valuable is that for the average handler to, oh, to recognize that sometimes you don't have to control or command, just do the opposite of what the dog wants. Yeah. And that, uh, we always talk about usually what's wrong with dogs is humanization. We think they're communicating like us, and they don't. But there's uh, we talk about there's things you can visually show your dog from a puppy that starts setting that up. So, like, puppies are in the house, and they're running behind me, and I'm going out to let them go out the bathroom. I'll walk up to the door, and I grab the doorknob. The dog's already between me and the door. I mean, as soon as that door opens, he's out, right? Yeah. So if you think about dogs and the way they're structured in their mind, leaders lead. So he was just the first one out the door. So like puppies, I'm going to walk up and I'm going to be so close to the door. He has to be behind me. So when I open it, I can get that first step out. You know, and that visual of me going out the door first. Uh, controlled feedings that a lot of people do. You pour the food in the bowl, have the dog sit, sit it down, tell him to eat. That you providing his food, leader. Um, you know, puppies, people want to sit on the couch, watch the ball game, and it's in his lap. Well, to the dog, they're on the same level. But if they yeah. sit at your feet, they got to look up. Leadership. The same way with puppies, I'll go for a walk. You know, especially 8, 10, 11-week-old pups, they can't manage that big grass. So I purposely go walk through it. It's going to slow them down enough that I'm ahead of them, and they're constantly catching up to me. They're fighting to get to me. And they're fighting to get to me. Yeah, every time I walk a little fast and they're 20 yards behind me, fights up to me, give them a pet, and we're going again. But it creates that follow mentality uh, that then turns into letting them run, and they run to the right, I'm walking to the left and calling them. Right. Um, you know, and a lot of people, uh, you're usually in a recall mode for the dog when he's going away. So the dog's running away from you, chasing another dog, a squirrel, a kid, or whatever. He's focused on that object. And if I automatically see that, the natural tendency is here, 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 here. But if you go, hey, Fido, and he turns and he stops and looks, and then you say, here, he just broke his attention from what he wanted to chase. Now he's looking at Dad, and he's like, oh, so he's got a treat, and he runs back. So there's a method. If you understand the communication and the method of what's going on in their mind, 
it helps you with those. You got to break up whatever thought process they and whatever the they're going to grab. You got to get their attention first. Yeah. And before you can ask them to do something. I Correct. mean, it, it's the same thing with us too. If we're all distracted and you know, we're married. If you're in there yeah. working with a dog and the wife comes in here and starts talking it right off, it's like, <laughs> hold up, just can't let, do it. We can't do both yeah. here. Like, <laughs> uh, let me, fin- let me finish this and then yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll pay attention. Well, Jeremy, so what did I, what did I not ask you that I should have asked you in this conversation? Mm. I don't know. I think the biggest thing is understanding the dog. Like always, you got to be smarter than a dog to be able to train it. So, you know, and I don't, I, I try not, novice people that don't know a lot, I don't try to get them into reading a lot of behavioral books. But once you find your plan and you get that started, start reading those. Because it, it's all about reading the dog. It's all about knowing what dog you got right in front of you that you're teaching it. Every single one of them is different. You know, there's no textbook bred litter that all eight of those pups are training the same way. It just yeah. doesn't. I wish it did, but it just doesn't happen. If it did, then everybody would have that dog. Great dogs, right? yeah. It's, yeah. it's an assembly line then, and that's what, that's what makes dog training so interesting to me is mm-hmm. that the intuition from the experience and the knowledge base, like all of that kind of comes together to be able to solve the puzzle. Cause yeah. if it's an assembly line, like to me, it's not that impressive. Right. Yeah. And, so, and uh, so when you talk about behavior books, are you talking operant conditioning, classical conditioning, like the actual behavior uh, side of dog uh, training or what? A little bit of that, just the thought process they have, how they see us. If you can learn communication with the dog, and keep that straight, I think that helps a lot of people. You know, yeah, they are our babies, and we love on them, but you can't have that first. It's exercise, discipline, affection. It's always in that order. It never changes. And, like, we flip-flop it a lot. We come home from a bad day at work. We want to sit down, rub the dog, pet on the dog. We need to feel good. Then we go out and train. He's out there in the field trying to do what you're telling him. He's like, let's go back to the house and sit down and watch, you know, sports center. I need some more petting. So it's understanding from eight weeks to three years old like Duke, it's still the same. It doesn't change. Um, operant conditioning, yes, a little bit. Um, because I'm not a – like I believe in clicker training and treat training, but you, dogs have to understand consequence. There's no way around that. Yeah. Um, they got to learn to know what happens when they don't make the right decision. Well, the problem with operant conditioning is so many people want to live in one quadrant out of oh, the yes. four. Yes. They don't recognize that All you four. can't ha- – like, operant conditioning is happening whether you recognize it or, or not. not, right? It's yeah. the people that they learn just enough to where, like, oh, positive reinforcement. I it's like that. Yeah. And they think that they're living in that one, and they don't understand that the other three quadrants are still happening. Yeah. And you're just you're you're missing all of it. So it is dangerous, but also like I feel like if 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 somebody fully understands the four quadrants and and the classical conditioning, there's so much value in that because while there is so much discrepancy from method to method, yeah. the four quadrants are the four quadrants regardless of method. Yeah. And uh, it's built into every single method. So there's a lot of books out there. Uh, one that comes to mind quick is like, don't shoot the dog, Karen Pryor. <laughs> yeah. You know, there are some of those books that are operate conditioning based, but they're talking about the structure of a pack. Right. But, you know, I always tell people they're not pack animals because they're domesticated, but they still communicate that way. You're not ever going to reprogram that. So understanding that and maybe finding some books that are a lot about that just lets you know kind of how they process the information they see. Yeah. When you know that and then you know the genetics of the dog and what they like to do, that's when there's no limit. You can run with that in a way. So it it just – but don't get too caught up into that because of not understanding. There's stuff outside of just positive reinforcement that you've got to use. I mean, if if you do go down that path, which I encourage everybody, especially if they have an interest in dog training, to at least familiarize themselves with that. Yeah. Uh, If you do, just absorb all of it. You know, you can't have one without the other three. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter which one. It, you know, nowadays, too, there are tons and tons and tons of clubs. HRC, AKC, NAVDA, you know. The, Even the working dog sections. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And, like, get around dog people. You know, get around people who have the experience. And, like, you know, understand a little bit. 
opinions are like you know what <laughs> everybody's got one but you got to know which ones you want to use which ones are real which ones are fake you know but the more you're around dog people the more you understand we're all the same yeah you know, we're all there for the dog you know they're not there to measure anything out of what i know versus you you know and it the more groups you can get involved with your dog the better i think because when you you hit a a, a speed bump in your training you got guys in the club or friends that have either went through it or talked to someone that went through it and they can pass along information that helps you you know yeah. so if you're doing it completely by yourself then you know it's the books we've talked about i think that really help and especially youtube i mean youtube you can find anything so like you know, just watch it. You know, it's read it, see it, do it. Then you might retain some of that and be able to kind of <laughs> right. like move forward with it. Yeah. Uh, but I think the more groups, more friends they develop out there, the better off their dog is, you know. And it's we've always used the mindset, too, of like it's never the dog's fault. It's never their fault. If yeah. we brought them into our world, it's our fault that we are not breaking it down enough for that dog to understand it. That don't mean that dog's not smart or not – ready to go or not a hunting dog it means you got to think a little bit you got to break some things down and figure out what's going to get him past that hurdle to move to the next Man, you're, you're really preaching to the choir i think there's nowhere nowhere else better to end on that one jeremy i i appreciate it i look forward to getting to know you a little bit better i know you know we're not in the same state but the southeast there's not too many yeah. not too many of us uh upland hunters or, or trainers down there unfortunately anymore and uh you know i'm gonna have to make it down to alabama and kind of come see on some down we'd love stuff. to have you down come see our place kind of see how we do things yeah. and with our programs, we we do have our gun dog program is more of our labs and the retriever breeds, but we always have GSPs and GWPs and Drots, Griffons. We've seen a lot of Griffons lately, a lot of different breeds. So that's like yeah. if you want to come down and see some, come on because we got them for sure, man. I'll, I'll definitely come. And anybody listening to this, I'll have uh, Whistling Wings kennels, the links and social media tags and, and all that stuff in the show notes so check that out if you want to follow jeremy and uh, thanks for joining us thank you thank you enjoyed yeah. it